Last May, I graduated from, from Harvard Business School. For the first time in my life, walking on campus, I felt that I was in the minority. Let's have a look at some statistics. These are for the class of 2015. 66% of the class was US citizens. 41% was women. I know this isn't terribly inspiring yet. However, 0.01% of the class was morbidly obese, which I should clarify that I completely made up. That statistic doesn't exist. Shockingly, Harvard does not publish statistics about the average BMI of their incoming class. And I didn't think there was a scientific way I could go about gathering that data that wouldn't lose me a lot of friends. But what didn't matter was the data. What mattered was my perception. Walking onto campus 130 pounds heavier than I am today, I was confident I was the only person a doctor would deem morbidly obese. For the first time in my life, I didn't just know that I had a serious weight issue, but I felt it instinctually. Every time I had to ask a classmate to scoot in so that I could get to my seat. Every decision I made in the cafeteria, sensing that others were watching me. Every time there was a costume party, and I knew that finding a unique outfit on the same day of an event is a luxury that only thin people have. And every time I wondered what a recruiter thought about my weight. Harvard Business School, the beacon of what we often associate with excess, transformed me. It didn't just teach me, but it dragged me through the process of understanding what it means to live a lean life and how to get there. It's easier in retrospect to connect the dots. This TED Talk is not about how to lose 130 pounds. For better or for worse, I figure there are plenty of resources on the internet that deal with such subjects, and frankly, I have nothing new to add to this area. When I talk about living a lean life, I'm really not talking about the physical at all. For me, the weight was an outward manifestation of the extra baggage that I carried around with me. Many of us create situations that hold us back artificially from being our authentic selves, and many of us will continue to do so. We'll buy a particularly expensive house in a particularly expensive neighborhood and use that as the reason that we can't leave the job we hate. We'll construct a group of friends and convince ourselves that we have to live a certain lifestyle to keep up with them. Or we'll put creating a family on hold because we have a roadmap for our career and we can't deviate from it. It's not that these issues have no truth to them, but we're often creating a false dichotomy. We have more than two extreme options. Living a lean life is about not adding layers of artificial fat around yourself that prevent you from reaching your goals. It's about allowing yourself the flexibility to learn what you love, to figure out where you create the most value, and to get there. It's about putting as few roadblocks in the way as possible. I won't claim it's easy, but it was definitely worth it. Here's what I learned over the last two years about how to live a lean life. Before my last day at work, a mentor de decided to impart some advice. He told me that I should lose weight before going to Harvard so that employers would be interested in hiring me. Because if you aren't smart enough to know what to put into your mouth, you can't possibly be that smart. Two things occurred to me then. First, that he's a jerk. I mean, seriously, who says that? That's a, that's a liability. Um, but the second thing that occurred to me was that without realizing it, I had placed conditions on my life that could prevent me from reaching my goals. The first important step in this process is to understand what the excess is in your life. Perhaps someone will start the inventory taking process for you, like I had in that moment. Maybe you'll be thrown into a new situation and all of a sudden the excess will become clear as day. Or maybe you'll have the courage to take the first step yourself right after listening to this talk. What is it that you feel constrained by? If it's not immediately obvious, think about the last time you said you would change your life if only it weren't for something. That something is the excess. The next important step is to figure out what it's doing for you to keep it around. Just like everybody else, I have a story. It's not particularly unusual. 
Mine involved, involves a father who became seriously addicted to drugs and who had quite a temper when high. The first time you run to a hotel with your mom and sister to avoid your dad's violence, you begin to wonder if the world is unsafe. By the 15th time, you're sure it is. Even after many years when the violence had ended, I was still scared. At nine years old, I decided who I was. I was the girl who cared deeply for the emotions of others, even before my own. I was the girl who was afraid. I was the girl who only deserved a certain amount of happiness because just being safe should make me happy enough. And I was the girl who would make myself small by making myself big. It took a lot of help from others and a lot of introspection to understand what my belief system was that was keeping the excess around. But it was the first very important step in letting go. As you look at your own life, what are the belief systems that you have about yourself that are holding you back? Are you the woman who always has the worst luck? The woman who's never had time to go back to finish your degree? Or the woman who always puts others before herself? Is it time for a change? When we imagine courage, it's easy to imagine save someone saving a family from a burning building. I hope we don't only see the opportunities for courage in these moments, because God willing, most of us won't have the chance to display it there. I'd instead like to provide some alternative examples of courage that I've seen over my last 26 years. Courage is military veterans sharing their experiences in combat. They're real innermost thoughts and feelings with friends, family, and coworkers who couldn't even begin to understand. Courage is a student who asks for tutoring help in an environment of people who seem to have never struggled once in their academic careers. Courage is a leader who realizes they were wrong and stands in front of their constituents and admits it. Courage is a boy, insecure himself, who stands up for a friend at sleepaway camp getting bullied. And courage is a woman who voices the concerns of a group of people who feel unheard. In my case, courage was a section mate asking me honestly what had kept me overweight. And courage was then me battling the urge to be defensive, something I believe I had been for a long time about this issue, and taking a hard, honest look within myself to figure out what had prevented change. When we stick to what we know, we often don't build the ability to change. And we may not even realize that our way of doing things is outdated. Looking back on it now, what Harvard provided me the opportunity to do was have practice in doing something constantly that was out of my comfort zone. Whether it was through a cold call, which is a 10-minute surprise grilling by a professor at the beginning of class, or by flying to a foreign country and helping a business solve their real problems in less than a week. The tasks themselves weren't important. What was important was that they provided me constant practice in doing things I didn't think I was capable of doing. All of a sudden, the way I had labeled myself and compartmentalized my life began to crumble. I wasn't the woman who was uncomfortable with numbers. I was in the top 20% of my finance class. And I wasn't the woman who was afraid. I watched myself say the hard things on behalf of others who couldn't find their voice. And I was no longer the woman who needed to be small. Soon, I began to exercise the muscle of doing things I didn't think I could. Now I was the woman who could be the captain of my section's basketball team, a position that would have scared me too much a year before amongst a group so fit. And now I was the woman who would turn down particular social situations that would be extra hard on my diet, even if it might disappoint others. Now I was the woman who would take care of me. Now that I'm over 100 pounds down, I find myself falling into the trap of comparing myself to everyone else. If I track BMIs, I'm still in pretty bad shape compared to the rest of you in this audience. But that's the wrong measure. When I focus on the right things, the amount of change within myself, the distance that I've come in my own journey, the way I view myself now, 
that's when I realize how far I've come. And I would have robbed myself of the joy of this experience if I focused solely on the numbers. I actually saw myself track the wrong metrics when I walked into Harvard. By the looks and pedigrees of everyone else, I assumed that they couldn't understand what it was like to grow up without a silver spoon. I was wrong. The man sitting next to me did understand hardship. He had put his life on the line for his country. And the woman sitting next to me did not have a clear path set out ahead of her. She was the first from her family to graduate from college. Not to mention, the man who did come from that privileged background had overcome numerous obstacles in his path to get to Harvard. It turned out that my class was a lot more diverse than I thought. As you evaluate your own life, how can you possibly compare yourself to others on the dimensions that matter, how positively you've affected your community, or how much impact you've had through your work and your family? The amount of cash we have or the size of our house are both pretty poor indicators of what we've accomplished, but they're the easiest to compare. We can do better than that, and we need to. Once you start tracking the right types of metrics, you may find that the excess begins to fall away. The day I looked in the mirror and decided that I would focus on who I could be, who I should be, was the day that things that had seemed so impossible before were just new items to add to the list of challenges I had overcome. So let me end with this. I dare you to reinvent the woman you think you are. I encourage you to live a lean life. I think you'll be surprised at the fullness that you find.